the civilization of Egypt and of Africa in general is the most written about and the least understood of all known subjects. This is not an accident or an error in misunderstanding the available information. Except for Egypt, African people have been written out of the respectable commentary of history. Europeans have claimed the non-African creation of Egypt in order to downgrade the position of African people in world history. They have laid the foundation of what they call Western civilization on a structure that the Western mind did not create. Africans with jet black faces once walked the earth all alone, no other races, until they traveled to the other lands, folded in the motherland, and then the cross began. That's when the frost began, the pigment loss began The further north this man traveled as he crossed new land The man in the ice who once walked in the sand Soon he began to lose this his This is the figure, the sculpture that was found Get on the inside in Europe. And one of the things that they have he discovered still Is that many of the sculptures of early Europe Show various African types In fact 50,000, 55,000 years ago, according to three labs, the University of Oxford, the University of Hawaii, the University of California at Berkeley have come to the conclusion that there are no people on the earth 55,000 years ago who are not black Africans. Logic, arithmetic, astronomy, geometry, and music, what we call the seven liberal arts. This was the educational system that was in place at the time that Greek people came to Kemen. Put my glasses on and actually read this a little bit. Yes. Problem number 56 in the Rin Mathematical Papyrus, that's the one you see up there, seeks to find the slope of a pyramid whose height is 250 cubits and whose base is 360 cubits. The answer is 5 and 1 25th palms for each cubit in height, representing the cotangent of the angle of the slope of the pyramid's face. Now, if you've got a cotangent, if you can find cotangents, you, can, you, you know the, the way you can find tangents is that you flip the co cotangent over. When you you have all that in place, and it's really just a matter of drawing it in, you then can find sine and cosine. So now, if they have the tangent and cotangent and the ability to find sine and cosine, by definition, they have trigonometry. This magnificent structure stands as tall as a 45-story building and is comprised of nearly two and one-half million stone blocks which weigh an average of two and one half tons each. This one building is comprised of enough stone to make 30 Empire State Buildings. The pyramid rises to a height of 481 and a half feet. It is built of 2.7 million blocks of stone. The smallest stone is two and a half tons, and the largest stone is somewhere between 70 and 100 tons. If you were to take the intact masonry of the Great Pyramid, by the way, can you hear me in the back? I don't want you to miss any of this. <coughs> if you could take all of the intact masonry of the Great Pyramid and cut it up into one foot blocks, you could, make, you could build a wall that would circle two thirds of the globe. And you know they built it without even using the wheel? They used to float thousand ton blocks of granite from Aswan 500 miles down the river and they can't even do that today. The pyramid was oriented precisely to the four cardinal points. The base of the pyramid, the side of each base of the pyramid was 755 feet 6 inches with an average error of one ten thousand. The casing stones that covered the pyramid were so finely jointed that you could not and cannot insert a piece of your hair in between the joints, even today, where they are still in existence. The area of the base of the pyramid is 13 acres. But it's real interesting. If you look at the height of the pyramid, it is, if you measure it, it is the radius of a circle that you can create 
by turning the base of the square base of the pyramid into a circle. And therefore, you can find the square base by uh, the area of the perimeter of the square base by 2 pi r. So that means they had built the constant, the geometric constant of pi, into the pyramid. The temple complex of Ipedi Sut, now called Karnak, was one of the greatest accomplishments ever achieved in Kemet. It is comprised of numerous temples, one of which contains the largest colonnaded hall ever constructed. This great hall consists of 136 columns, which stand in 16 rows. The tallest columns are 69 feet high and are large enough to accommodate a group of 100 men standing on its apex. This one room has enough floor space to equal the Cathedral of Notre Dame in Paris. And the entire complex is large enough to accommodate all of the churches built in London since the birth of Jesus to Christ. Look at this. Look at this. Who built like this? Is it awesome or what? Now Hippocrates taking sections, sections out of the work of earlier Egyptian writers without giving any credit to them at all. Pythagoras, the Pythagorean theorem was worked out long ago. Pythagoras spent seven years, some people say 22 in Egypt. And he comes back with all this even medical theories and brings it all back to Greece and all the claim. All the great European scholars went to Africa. Thales of Miletus, Democritus, Pythagoras, Eudoxus. There's a whole list, a whole list of them walking into Africa picking up things from astronomy, geometry, medicine, etc., and going back home and claiming it to be theirs, father of this and father of that, when they're the children. <laughs> you go and look at their medicine. I spoke to, in Atlanta to the Center for Disease Control. The Africans had aspirin before us. They were using salix capensis, which is salicylic acid, the main active ingredient in aspirin. They were using tetracycline 14 centuries ago in Nubia. They found the yellow-green flash of tetracycline in Nubian bones 14 centuries ago. They only started using that antibiotic in America in the 1950s. They pioneered in several operations. They pioneered in the caesarean operation. Dr. Finch has written a fine thing on the caesarean. At the time when it, that operation was experimental in Europe, People like Dr. Felkin went into Africa and observed the Banyoro surgeons performing the caesarean, and the mother was hale and hearty after four or five days. No woman survived the caesarean in Europe in the 1870s, none. No woman survived. And they observed the operation, the way they stitched, the way they opened the belly, the way, the, way, the kind of instruments they used, they observed they were using, one of the instruments, the cautery iron, with such fantastic skill, it was very minor tissue damage, it caused great ruptures in the European hospital. They found that Africans were using both anesthetics and antiseptics in their operating theaters at that time, when in Europe, Listed only introduced antiseptics two years earlier than the witness of this operation, which the witness said must have been going on for quite a while because the Africans were performing with routine skill what was then experimental surgery in Europe. No wonder Mama sent me to college. No wonder she said, son, remember the, the powers and the knowledge. That the calendar we use today is derived from the Egyptian. They were the first people to invent the second of time, the second of art. The hour, the minute, their astronomical observations over many years produced these ideas, these precise quantities and volumes and times and standards which were later to dominate the world. The Babylonians did not have any proper calendar. The Egyptians had the 365 and a quarter days. That calendar 
was invented in Ethiopia since 4,241 BC. And before I leave Egypt, as I say, I don't want to dwell too much in that, but other parts of Africa. But before I leave that, let me mention the second discovery, which Sheik Antidi pointed to today, of Ta Seti, the discovery of a monarchy in the Nile Valley preceding the Egyptian, at least two centuries before the first Egyptian dynasty. And at Ta Seti, they found not only architectural forms to which Dr. Diop pointed to this morning, they found the falcon god Horus, they found the crown, the unmistakable, the, the uniquely shaped crown of the Egyptians, they found the palace facades that were later used by the Egyptians, and above all, they found the hieroglyphs so that the world's first major writing system is not even Egyptian, it is Ethiopian. Back in the day that when I was schooling blind and unwise to the lies, my professor was spewing forth like it was written in stone. I didn't know that under him, yo, the truth was unknown. About seven centuries ago, they found Africans were plotting an invisible star, Sirius B. Sirius A is a bright star we all see in the night sky. Sirius B is impossible to see with the naked eye. It is impossible to see it with the naked eye. It has a magnitude of about 8.5. And the Africans not only saw it, they plotted its orbit and trajectory right up to the end of the 20th century, up to the year 1990. And the diagram produced by our best Astronomy today is identical with what they produced centuries ago. We only became aware of that star towards the end of the 19th century. And not only that, they intuited its mass. This is a white dwarf. It is an imploded star. It's not only impossible to see with the naked eye, it is, only, it is the most sophisticated astronomy that has shown us that a star so imploded is much heavier than stars that appear six times brighter and larger. They came to that conclusion. They had plotted the spiral structure of the Milky Way. They had seen the Jupiter and Saturn, the rings and the moons thereof. They had worked all of that up, but particularly Sirius B. It caused such astonishment, such consternation in astronomical circles that Kenneth Bretcher, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Cambridge, Massachusetts, he said, the Africans have no business knowing any of this. The architect responsible for the design of the Step Pyramid was a man named Imhotep. Imhotep was recorded in history as the world's first multi-genius. He was a prime minister to Zoser. He was a poet, a philosopher, a physician. He is considered to be the author of the world's oldest medical treatise ever written. It is a document that is now called the Edwin Smith Medical Papyrus. This book describes 48 different injuries to the head, to the face, to the neck, in the spinal column. My teacher, he had nothing much to say to me. He kept seeking the truth. Only more questions came to me. He kept seeking the truth about how all this came to be. He kept seeking the truth about how they was blaming me. He kept seeking the truth, and now it's plain to see. Kim and New made it all clear to me. The Greek said, who actually saw these Egyptians, apart from all the evidence that Sheikh Anthony Up has brought forward and others. There is evidence the migration, the movement of agriculture, every major plant in Egypt. At least half a dozen are from coming from the south. There's not a single plant that comes down to the south. This nonsense about civilization, that civilization in Egypt was created by Asiatics and Caucasoids, and then they brought the light of civilization down to the benighted black barbarians in the south. Not a single spread of evidence. They found, for example, mathematical systems in Africa. The first use of numbers, the first scientific evidence of the use of numbers is found in the Congo Zaire. It's known as Ishango bone. It's 8,000 years old. It's very simple, but it's, it is cited because it's the first evidence we do have. 
But we have found more complex, far more complex mathematical systems, like the Yoruba, for example, are found to be using a complex mathematical system, which one of the mathematicians, Conan, calls one of the most abstract and complex mathematical systems. Why didn't we know about this? Because if you go among the Bushmen and the Kalahari, or the Wugabuga and the Lugabuga, you're not going to find mathematics. <laughs> Look at mathematics in Europe. It was nothing. Do you know that when the number system 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, that's Hindu, the Arabs and Africans invaded Europe as Moors, and the Arabs brought from India the numbers Fibonacci, yes, brought it to Europe first in 1202, but the Europeans didn't accept it because the church said numbers are works of the devil. <laughs> it's as late as the 17th century. He said that, you know, this, uh, the, he became more alert and more uh, human being. He became more, uh, more, you see, Malone, became a more human being. Not just human being, he became a more yourself. You achieve your destiny when you go to Kemet school. You became a human being, more human. We are human beings already, but the more human being. That means more wise. And when you go to Kemet school, when Plato himself compared what they do in the school, I give Greek because uh, it will be no debate. You see, it's, uh, our school, our school in Greece, the way we are doing things is uh, just uh, for creatures like pigs. You see, like pigs. You see, and he said, myself, I'm ashamed. Myself, as a plate, I'm ashamed. We do things like that, it's a shame. And also, not only for myself, as a all, for all Greek, the Greek world is a shame. What we can do, our education, when you compare with a Kemet, is not even for human beings, it's for just for pigs, for animals. And he claimed the creation of Rome and Greece. I can show you. I can do more in proving to you that Rome and Greece was not Europe than anybody else can prove that Egypt was not Africa. Rome and Greece was not Europe. Two Mediterranean inspired nations because when they rose there was no Europe. That's hard on your imagination. What created Europe? The challenge of Rome and Greece. Fighting Rome and Greece, they got themselves together to fight it or try to destroy it. Getting themselves together to fight this challenge made them a nation. They began to have facsimile nations and they weren't even clear on the nation concept in Europe until near the end of the 18th and the 19th century. And you, you actually thought, here's the people who came into the world civilized. And Europe was born when the ancient world was ending at the beginning of the modern world. There was no Europe in ancient times. documents we can read very easily and there may well be independent confirmation of the historicity of some form of a Trojan War in those documents and so what I'm really asking is why is it that we're just really looking in one direction when we're talking about the origins of Greek civilization? Um, when Alexander entered Egypt he wrote home to his mother and said that he at last reached the land where the Greek gods began, Apollo and Zeus. And he wanted to consult one of the great African teachers of oracles. And the oracle asked, how old is this man? He said, 32. He said, in 20 years, Maybe he'll be wise enough to ask me a question that I care to answer.
We just have to be very careful, and this is something that happens in all movements, not to claim that everything is black. That is not necessary. The contributions of the black to the world are so great in terms of what we know now that it is not necessary to claim things that are not necessarily true. In the field of medicine, for example, they have found incredible things. They found vaccines among Africans long before Edwin Jenner. They found a smallpox vaccine had been brought to this country by Onesimus, a slave of Cotton Martha. They found that the Africans were using aspirin long before the Western nations, that the Bantu were using salix capensis, which yields salicylic acid, the main active ingredient in aspirin. They found the Africans had made breakthroughs in eye cataract surgery in the 13th century. Africans were performing eye cataract surgery in the empire of Mali in the city of Jenne. Nobody in the world was performing eye cataract surgery at the time. Nobody knows unless you study the history of medicine that that was what happened. And so, how could you compare Sumer with Egypt? Ur, Lagash, and those places, those were city-states. They did not have the centralized network, the empire that the Egyptians created. And look at their writing system, the cuneiform tablets, the merchant bills and notes. They did not have the great literature of the Egyptians. Where is their literature compared to the literature of the Egyptians? The thousands of things that we have found even today in spite of the devastation. And look at their architecture. Who could compare the architecture of the Egyptians with the Sumerians. We cannot even reconstruct the Mesopotamian temple when the Egyptian works stand immortal upon the face of the earth. When the Sphinx, when the great pyramid was finished and it had its polished limestone casing, they say it was like a star over the earth. You could stand for hundreds of miles and see it shining. What is there in Sumer and in Babylon like that? They say the stone that was involved in the building of the Great Pyramid could build 30 Empire State buildings. If you were to cut it into one foot cubes, it would encircle two thirds of the belly of this planet. What are they talking about? And you look at all these things, you look at the medical documents you find in those Edwin Smith papyri, helminthiasis, ophthalmology, gynecology, pregnancy diagnosis, Many things, studies of the pulse, studies in diagnostic percussion, fractures of the clavicle, dislocation in the mandible. Word for word, Hippocrates takes out the fractures of the clavicle and dislocation in the mandible and puts it in his work. And he's the father of medicine. But where are the books, they say? The earliest books in the world are African. The book of the dead, or rather it should be called the book of the coming forth by night and day. The pyramid texts, the papyrus of Ani. You will hear tomorrow from Dr. Ben the profound, profound impact of those books upon the thinking of the Greeks. Look at the medical literature of the world. They said the clinical method began with the Greeks. It did not. You can read the Edwin Smith papyrus, Dr. Finch, whom you will hear tomorrow. Dr. Finch has done a commentary recently for the journal on the Edwin Smith papyrus, showing it as only one third of an earlier manuscript written down in the 18th dynasty by a surgeon in Egypt, and that it only deals with the head and neck and the brain. Yet there are 200 terms. There are 200 medical terms for things inside and outside the head. He said that they discovered in that very early time things which we only know today through x-rays. He said that they found the locus in the brain with, through which auditory information is processed. They were working on pulse taking 1,000 years before Her Herophilus the Greek who was credited with pulse taking. The oldest rendering of a boat was also found in Kemet and was said to have been painted over 5,000 years ago. 
This 132-foot ship is one of the oldest boats ever discovered. It was with vessels such as this that the king Ka Kepra Ren Sen Roseret I crossed the Mediterranean Sea and founded the city of Athens in Greece around 1897 BCE. This is Amenhotep III, the father of King Tut. This is Amenhotep III's wife. Can you go back? To, yes, we'll to go Amenhotep. back to Amenhotep III. Yes. This, now, this is who now? This is King Tut's father. And also Pharaoh Akhenaten's father, the founder of monotheism. Or as they, some people think Save. he's the founder. Yeah. That's not true, but uh, <laughs> okay. monotheism is that's older another, than Akhenaten. That's another program. <laughs> that's another program. That's another program. So this is Amenhotep III. This is Amenhotep III's wife, Queen T. Uh, again, this was a queen that they could easily project just like Nefertiti, but no one ever sees her. Where yeah. are these images in, in the textbooks, etc.? They're not in the textbooks. They're in the Cairo Museum. So Nefertiti here. And let's look at her tomb. Now, this picture of Nefertiti, we don't even know is Nefertiti for sure. It was found on the floor of an artist's workshop. But this is the most famous image of Kemet anywhere in the world. You say artist's workshop, artist's where? Uh, in, in Kemet. Oh, in Egypt. Okay. In Egypt, yes. What's important is that when Kemet appears in the human record, it appears in 3100 BC with a fully developed civilization. Writing was already in place, astronomy was already in place, they already had the 365 day year calendar and one quarter for the leap year and all of that. That calendar had actually been put in place around 4236 BC, so we're talking about a fully developed high technical civilization. Mm -hmm. It's true. You I was in the knowledge. To, uh, determine the circumference of the earth unless you have, of course, presupposed that the earth was round. Mm -hmm. We want to point that out. Um, all of the mathematics uh, that we study today has its roots in Africa. Uh, we can start off simply with, with counting. The very first or the oldest known artifact in mathematics is the Ashango bone. That's over 8,000 years old. It's from the Congo. That's, that's found in Africa. Uh, if we go ahead, they had developed fractions. Furthermore, they had developed algebra and, of course, geometry, trigonometry. <coughs> this was found in Saqqara, dated to 300 B.C., and at first was said to be a uh, bird until a NASA engineer said, next slide, please, Birds do not have reverse dihedral wings and vertical tails. So this is a glider and an aerodynamically sound glider. 
Not an airplane, but they, it just shows you that in African science, they had already started experimenting with uh, aerodynamics 300 years before Jesus was born. So again, why are we afraid to be engineers? Do it. And they were not using 50-ton blocks which the Egyptians put at the top of their skyscrapers. They were using two-ton blocks of stone, and they couldn't do it. So make no mistake, you are dealing with extraordinary people. Because the next myth coming up in the 21st century is how the Japanese are the superior people of the world. It's going to shift from the European to the Asiatic. So get it quite clear. In the very early stages of civilization, something very unusual happened. I was with my wife in Egypt last summer and we went to Aswan. And I looked at the block, an obelisk, a stone obelisk which had been cut many centuries ago. And I looked at the way it had been cut, the perfection of the cut. I looked at the stone. And I wondered why they had abandoned this obelisk. They abandoned it, they said, because it had a flaw. And I looked carefully, it is true, my eyes are not what they used to be. I could not see this flaw, so I used my hands, which are extremely sensitive, and it had to be pointed out to me where the flaw was, and it was very clear to me it would have taken centuries for that flaw to really make a difference. But our people didn't play around with things. It had to be perfect. When the Japanese were building the pyramid, when they tried to put the stones in alignment, they cracked and broke and were badly scratched. When they went to check the stones that the Egyptians had put into alignment one one thousandth of an inch accurate. Not a single stone was scratched or cracked. You are dealing with people who felt you had to be as perfect as possible. Let us pray that those of us, our people who learn of their heritage, their ancestors, will not accept mediocrity as their standard.